of what, why is it important? What, what does it matter if it's written in Hebrew or Greek? And the answer to that is it doesn't matter at all unless you care about the truth of Scripture. Oh. And if you care about the truth of mm -hmm. Scripture, it makes a huge difference because everything we know about our Hebrew Messiah, we know through a Greek filter of a different language, culture, and thought. Everything we know about Hebrew Messiah. In this very special installment of the Messianic Tour Observer, I sit down with acclaimed and accomplished author, ancient language researcher, linguist, teacher, and most importantly, Messianic disciple, believer of Yeshua Messiah, Dr. Miles R. Jones, to discuss his groundbreaking landmark work on the Hebrew Gospels. And I'll tell you, most of the questions we've had over the years regarding the original language the Gospels were written in, what happened to those original manuscripts, and ultimately, what happened to those Messianic believers of the early, early assemblies who embraced those original Gospel texts and the Hebrew Scriptures and Jehovah's way of life. Those questions will be answered here in this post. My friends, of the true faith once delivered. My brothers and sisters, this is a discussion you don't want to miss. Shalom and welcome. And greetings, saints of the Most High. Welcome to the Messianic Tour Observer. I'm Rod Thomas, your friend and brother in the true faith once delivered. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to fellowship with me here today. I'm excited to be with you, as always. And it is my hope, trust, and prayer that this installment of the Messianic Tour Observer finds you, your families, and fellowships well and blessed. Well, as I mentioned in the intro, today's installment is quite special. Special in that I have for you a very special guest who graciously granted me an interview, which you will see is more of a sit-down discussion than it is an interview, which I have to say I thoroughly enjoyed participating in. His name is Dr. Miles Jones, and some of you may recognize his name from the many appearances he's made on various platforms and shows, both nationally and internationally. More importantly, you may recognize him from the work he's done and is currently doing on the Hebrew Gospels, the ancient Hebrew writings discovered in the Sinai wilderness leading to the true Mount Sinai, and the, his very important work as the founder of the Institute for Accelerated Learning, from which the famed Jones's geniuses emerged. I won't go any further in my introduction of him, as doing so will only take away from the precious time he's given us to discuss this very important subject of the Hebrew Gospels. And at the end of the discussion, I'll return with brief closing remarks and more detailed information as to how you can get a hold of his books, check out his teachings, and support his Jehovah-ordained ministry. So with that, I give you Dr. Miles R. Jones, and I'll see you on the other side. And we are back and I want to welcome everybody here today. Um, I've got a very special post for you today, which is completely out of the norm for what I normally do, which is you get to hear me ramble on and on and on about Hebrew root stuff and things like that. But I've got a very special guest and this is so opportunistic and it's so wonderful to have here with me today. Actually, he's spending the week with us. So we're, we're triply blessed. We're well, five times blessed because he's been here with us uh, since uh, Sunday evening. But I have with me here today Dr. Miles Jones. And Dr. Miles Jones 
is the founder of the ministry called B'nai Emona Institute for Accelerated Learning. I'm sure I butchered the Emona. <laughs> Emuna. Emuna. And, um, and he is the author of three books. The first one that I know of is The Writing of God, Secret of the Real Mount Sinai. The other one is Sons of Zion versus Sons of Greece. And the third one is The Coming Crisis, Answering the Call from Sinai in a Time of Crisis. Um, and the thing is that I really excited to have him here to talk to us today because this is a niche, 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 niche thing that I've had the opportunity to talk to him about. And this has to do with the Hebrew Gospels. Now, if you're like me, well, I know most of you are like me. <laughs> we, have been, we have been taught all our lives that the Gospels, that the apostolic writings, that the epistles were all drafted and written in Greek, Koine Greek. And, the, and so, but we've all had this little concern about us, within us, that it probably was not all written in, the, in Greek. So there's certainly uh, that, that question, but you know, scholarship tells us that it was all done in Greek. So we've got something here that will be groundbreaking, and I'm so excited to introduce this concept to you. And what I want to talk to Dr. Miles about today, I want to, I'd like to ask him, what exactly is the Hebrew Gospels, which is the thing that you're working on right now? Well, the uh, early church fathers, you're, you're talking about where we've all been told they were all written in Greek. Yes. Well, that's not really the case. I mean, it doesn't even pass the smell test. Every, every single author in the Bible was a Hebrew, but every single manuscript in the New Testament was written in Greek. Does that pass the smell test? No. Well, it wasn't, of course. And the early church fathers said so. But we're ignoring the early church fathers because when you read, you've got to realize that spin was not invented in the 20th, in the 21st <laughs> century. It's been with us all along. There have been politics and scholarship. Okay, so they're trying to reinforce a narrative or an agenda, usually a doctrinal agenda, you know, one of which is they created a Greek church. Yes. And it was very important to the authority of this Greek church. And this was in the fourth century with Constantine, the Greco Roman church. And the authority of scripture was their authority as a church. So the language of scripture, starting a Greek church, you want to convince people that the earliest, most authentic documents of the Bible are in Greek. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're a Greek church. Now, if you're, you're doing a Roman church, you want to convince people that the earliest, most authentic books of the Bible were written in Latin, the language of Rome, you know. And uh, however, the truth is a little different. You know, it's kind of a mix of both. The early church father said Matthew was originally written in Hebrew. Now, we also discovered that Luke also, it was sort of packaged with Matthew, if you will, because none of them took uh, none of the apostles, none of the, or the gospel writers uh, took credit for their books. They were all published anonymously. We know about them because other early church fathers commented on who wrote what. So we can figure it out. But they all said that Matthew wrote the original gospel about 10 years after the crucifixion. So that would be about 39, 38 AD, 40 AD maybe but no later than that. So about 10 years, less than 10 years, like nine years after the crucifixion, Matthew came out with uh, the Gospel of Matthew, which is the longest and the most detailed. He is a, an eyewitness. So th this is really the foundation of what we call Christianity. Now Luke was, Luke and Mark are second-hand accounts, uh, as is John, actually is a second-hand account, may not even have been written by John. Wow. Yeah, that's a biggie. Wow. Uh, that is a real biggie. But, uh, the, and we can get into that if you want, but the proof of it is very solid and comes straight from Scripture. But they needed, you understand, they needed a gospel written by an apostle in Greek to counterbalance the Hebrew gospel of Matthew. Right? Was it a cover-up? 
Well, that's Absolutely. not really a cover up. It's just n now they have this other apostle to counterbalance Matthew, and it's like, Ma Ma otherwise, Matthew becomes the cornerstone of Christianity, a Hebrew gospel, mm -hmm. all right? And uh, because Mark and Luke are secondhand, like I said, that doesn't mean they're not the sacred word of God. It just means what it means. They never knew Yeshua when he was alive, walked the earth. You know, they're getting it as secondhand information. So obviously you should place more weight in firsthand information than in secondhand information. You see, you see the point? I see your point. Yes. So they needed somebody to counterbalance Matthew. So that, that's why they assigned. Uh, remember, John 2 was published anonymously. And it ah. was the last one published. And it was the one that had the least authenticity about it. All the other Gospels, we know who published them. They talked about them, even in Scripture. They talked about Luke as being, Luke as being an author of one of the Gospels, being a Gospel writer. Paul mentioned it. You know, so we know, we know about their parentage. John is the one we have the least attribution about. However, Luke was also written in Hebrew, as far as we know, and, wow. was, and was lumped together with Matthew, because they're all anonymous, right? So there's no thing that starts, oh, okay, Matthew ends here, and, and Luke starts here. So it's all the Hebrew gospel. How do we know that? God, that's going to be my question. The, the early church fathers uh, quoted from it. They said uh -huh. the Hebrew gospel said this, the Hebrew gospel said that, right? Mm -hmm. So there are about 80 quotations from the Hebrew gospels in the early the early church literature, right? Every church father said that it was originally written in Matthew. No church father denied that it was written in, in originally written in Hebrew by Matthew, right? But Luke was also written. So we know that because of the quotations that were made. They came many of them come from Luke, not from Matthew. So that was part of the Hebrew gospel. Now when it was later translated into Greek, they like uh, augmented it so it sort of doubled in size okay so they added more information to it so Luke is kind of a hybrid in that sense so it's an interesting but we know this because I, I am a linguist you know the subtext of the language that was written in yeah you know like uh, we hopefully many of us have studied a foreign language and you probably had to write in that language at some point you know, in the, the the words may have been in Spanish, but the underlying structure of it was all in English. Oh. It didn't fool your teacher, and you can't fool a linguist. They can they can read something and know what the underlying structure of it is. Right. A lot of it has to do with idioms, but there's also grammatical things and vocabulary things that can tell them what the subtext of it is, what it was originally written in. So Luke was definitely written originally in Hebrew also. And uh, as far as I know, Mark was written, written in Greek as far as I know. John may have been written in Greek. It's hard to say. I think the earliest surviving document was probably in Greek mm -hmm. from the evidence that I have. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it wasn't originally written. Now, the, the other books of the Bible that were written, we don't know about Acts yet, don't have any sure evidence. Mm -hmm. But if Luke was written in Hebrew, then Acts, it's like a two-part letter you know, Luke and Acts, to Theophilus. But the other books of the New Testament that we know were written in Hebrew go from Hebrews to Revelation. They were all written in Hebrew originally. Uh, there, uh, Clement of Alexandria and other church fathers say Hebrews was written by Paul in Hebrew. It's wow. a letter to the Hebrews. I mean, this it's is like, a letter to the Hebrews. It's like a big duh, yeah. you know, right? It was written in Hebrew. That makes sense. And guess who it was that translated into Greek? Luke translated into Greek. Wow. He translated Hebrews into Greek. So he knew Hebrew and he knew Greek. Wow. Right? So he was a very, he was a doctor. He was a very smart, educated man. Uh, Hebrews was written. So you've got 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And th these apostles, they did not know Greek. Matthew did. Paul did. All right. But the other apostles, they did not know Greek. I mean, these were Galilean fishermen. They were not literate. It says they were literate. Talks about John and Peter mm -hmm. in in Acts. They were taken before the high priest. I said they were they were unlettered. They were they were illiterate, you know. But they were speaking boldly, and they that's when they took notice of them as having been with Yeshua, having been with the Messiah. It's the first time they took note of it. 
Right. So is it safe to say they had scribes <coughs> that were actually writing down their words? That's very possible. possible. Where that they had a, it's called a they would get a they would get a scribe and they would dictate to him. Mm-hmm. If they had a scribe that knew Greek, he could have written it down in Greek as well. Okay. Which is possible. But you can tell when something has been dictated. Yes. A lot of spelling errors. Oh. That wasn't exactly what I was thinking. If uh uh, generally, if you copy something from a book, mm-hmm. you know, you're not going to make any errors. It's all there, right? Now, if you yes. see a word misspelled and you know how to spell it correctly, you're probably going to fix right. it, right? You're not going to just repeat that mistake. So mm-hmm. you have fewer spelling errors when you copy correctly from a book. But when you dictate a manuscript, four scribes and do four copies at once, or six scribes and do six copies at once. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, you were telling me earlier this week that um, there were two lines of, of uh, there was a received text, uh-huh, right. and then there was uh, another line of, of text. Uh, could, you, could you elaborate? Because I think that's well, so the, important. The narrative of history in the West has been dictated by the Roman Church, who is the most powerful yes. one. And the, of course, since they're the most powerful, they declared their doctrine to be orthodox and everybody else to be a heretic. And I guess 15, uh, take another thousand years before the Reformation said, no, we're not buying that. Mm-hmm. Right? So what they, they have declared, of course, that the, the most, uh, the original Bibles were, were Catholic Bibles. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's not, historically, that's not true. The first compilation of the Bible as we know it, a compilation meaning all the books of the Bible put together in the same place, Old Testament, New Testament, right? As a compilation, not a bunch of manuscripts all hanging out there, which is what they were in the first place. Mm-hmm. They were all separate manuscripts yes. that were out there. But the first compilation was actually in 150 AD, and it was done in Latin. It's called old, the Old Latin version, or the Italic. Or the is called the Italic version. Okay. Or the old Italic. I remember now you're telling me right. that. Yes. And so it was originally written in Latin, which is interesting, but it was also done by people who knew Hebrew. Mm-hmm. Like probably in Antioch. They will say it was done in Alexandria, but I don't think that is true. We do not know who did it, frankly. Okay, but they had very deep Hebrew roots. They knew the Tanakh, they knew the Hebrew Gospels. The people that did this, very possibly they were Jewish Christians. But what we have in the in the Itala is done in Latin. You know, they all the original documents of the Bible were still out there. Yes. When they did this first compilation. I mean, it's pretty amazing. This is normally the one you think this is the one. This is the most orig- uh, the most authentic, right? Right. About well, what, what time frame were we talking about? One fifty. One fifty AD. Oh. So that was like a uh, little more than a hundred years after the crucifixion. Yes. Yeah, so it's uh, it's amazing. That would definitely be the most authentic version, oh, and absolutely. it was it was absolutely adored uh, as as considered to be the most authentic by all the churches throughout Europe and 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 to the East. And about another hundred hundred and fifty years later, hundred forty years later, Lucian of Antioch, who was probably also a Jewish Christian, uh, Messianic. He was a Hebrew speaker. He did the first compilation of the Bible in Greek. Mm -hmm. So the first compilation of the Bible in Latin, the first compilation of the Bible in Greek, Mm -hmm. they were done by Hebraic roots people. Wow. Now, almost surely, because of the skills they displayed. Mm -hmm. You know, and these people had access to the earliest manuscripts Lucian, uh, the the Antiochians were the the center of Christianity, of Messianic Christianity, the center of Christianity itself, which was a Messianic affair in the first centuries. Because yes. most of the practitioners were Jewish Christians, and then the Gentiles started to come in, but they were still part of the Messianic Church. But then, as more and more it spread further and further, and more and more, you know, Gentiles came into the mix. Many of them were in churches that didn't have any Jewish Christians in there. They were Greek-speaking churches, so the garden grew, and some yeah. of the some of the plots were all Greek speakers. Uh, right? Rome was a Greek-speaking church. 
Rome, wow. Rome was, yeah. It was the uh, lingua franca of the world since Alexander the Great yes. had conquered the world and left all these Greek speakers in these Greek cities. Things started to change at the death of the apostles, which came, uh, John lived into the 90s. Mm -hmm. So uh, that would be about uh, 90 AD to 100 AD. This is probably the approximate range of time when he died. And they also credit him for writing the gospel in that time period, which is one of the things that just doesn't hold true. In any case, after the death of the apostles, most of your leaders now, the church had gone spread far and wide, and most of your leaders were now Gentiles, Greek-speaking Gentiles. Okay, so you, you started to have this Greek church thing going, and there was a rising tide of anti-Semitism. Because they there were wars, right? You yeah, remember the yeah. wars? The, the the stubborn Jews they kept rebelling they against kept the rebelling. Romans. Yes. It had happened in the Maccabean revolt. Yes, a couple of centuries before Yeshua came, mm -hmm. and they threw off the Greek yoke and they reestablished independence for Israel for almost a century. Conquer back all their territory, all the territory they'd had during Solomon's time, and a little more. They maintained their independence. They threw off the Greek yoke. So they were waiting for this other Messiah, this Messiah to come back and throw off the Roman yoke, right? In the, yes, in the yes, first century. Yes. That's who they were. They were tied up with Messianic fever. And every time they had a new uh, rebel leader rise up against the Romans, they would anoint him the new of the Messiah. <laughs> of course, then when he lost, he couldn't be the Messiah. He been the Messiah, <laughs> would, the Messiah wouldn't lose. Yes. So you had the Maccabee revolt. Nobody had forgotten that one. And then you had the revolt in 68-70, mm. in which they, the Romans razzed the temple in Jerusalem. It's about a two-year time frame for the 68 The revolt, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it wasn't easy for Rome to put these things down. Yeah. And then they had another one about 100 A.D., a little, little after probably, uh, that would took part not in Jerusalem, but in the diaspora, started in Cyprus and, and the different regions. But it were, was definitely a Jewish revolt against the Romans. And there were areas that Romans didn't recapture again for a couple of years. So the diaspora revolt was really significant, you know, in terms of the number of people killed. And it was a big deal. But it wasn't in Jerusalem because they had, they had pretty much yeah. put their boot on Israel at this point. But then in 135, there was another revolt, the Bar Kutcher revolt. Right. And of course, they, Rabbi Akiva said he was the new he Messiah. Right? Very famous <laughs> rabbi. He's the new Messiah, the conquering king Messiah. And this time, Rome was really, really tired of having to deal with Israel. They left a million and a half. Israelis dead in, in wow. the streets. A million wow. and a half. That's a lot. I mean, it, it just, it, it's just hard to express the anguish of all that. And of course, people were fleeing all over the place. It had been a century and a half of war hmm. by Rome against against Israel. A century and a half, off and on. That's a long time. It's war. an awfully long time. And during that period of time, they killed, Rome killed as many Jews proportionately as were killed in the Holocaust, about one out of three worldwide. Amazing. So it was a, a horrible thing. They called them the, the Messianic Wars. The Messianic Wars. Right. And so this Messianic religion comes along. And Rome is scared. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to spread all over the empire. So they were, that's why there was so much persecution of the early church, you know, because that the, the Messian, it was a Messianic church, and they felt like it was going to spread revolt. After a while, they figured it out that this church was not doing revolt. But a lot, there were a lot of Gentiles that were obviously under the gun and that were oppressed and even and martyred even because of this perception of them as being Messianics that were going to were out to start start a war against Rome. So the, the Greek part of the church very rapidly wanted to divorce itself from the Judaic part of the church. Yes. And so there was a rising tide of anti-Semitism. And a lot of it, I mean, I guess you can say it's justified because they were being persecuted for the perception of Rome that, you know, hey, I'm not, 
I'm not Jewish. I didn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't start a revolt. <laughs> But and the fact is, it was there was a lot of anti-Semitism, and, and we know who the root cause of all this yeah. comes from. It's Satan, it's the top, you yes. know. And yes, of course, they were they were squirming to get out from under it and to prove that they were not Jewish, right? Mm -hmm. So they created a new church, a Greek church, and divorced themselves from the Jewish church. But in the process, and this is absolutely critical. And this is the time of Constantine now. We're talking, you know, we're talking the fourth century. Church. They created a new church, which is not called from scripture. There's only one church. And yes. Jehovah established that at Mount Sinai yes. with a building, with doctrine, with anointed leaders. Yes. All right. There's only one church, and that's what there is now. And whatever your the label of your denomination says you're part of that one church or you're not. Amen. You are walking Amen. with you are walking yes. with your in covenant with your creator mm -hmm. or you're not. It's that simple. Am I missing anything here? Not at all. <laughs> and we've been talking about covenant walking, right. covenant obedient covenant walking right. for for many 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 episodes. And, and you're so, just so you're, if you reject the Torah as legalism, guess what? You just missed the bus. You missed the bus. Yeah, that's the royal law of God Himself. You know, and you just rejected it. And we're, this is exactly what they did in the fourth century. They declared, and this is so critical. They declared the messianic apostolic church of Yeshua the Messiah or Jesus Christ if you prefer mm -hmm. they rejected his church and declared it to be heretic and within the century they were hunting those people down and killing them and burning their scriptures so and these are the Hebrew these this is the church of Yeshua the Messiah Yes, but they, you know, and, their, and the twelve apostles. And the 12 it was apostles. that church. That church. That's the church they declared heretic, and they they weren't. I mean, I've studied them. They were very orthodox. They believed in the same things the mainstream church did. They did keep Torah, mm -hmm. but they believed in all the same doctrines. They were not heretic. Now there were offshoots. The Ebionites were a little bit different, and they had some things that you know one could object to. Yes, uh, uh, but that you know that doesn't mean you kill them. <clears throat> no. Right, you know, just a whole doctrine that it's okay for us to kill other believers over doctrinal differences. This was actually sanctified by Saint Augustine mm. in in four ten, right? Wow! Yeah, the the barbarians had just overrun Rome, and he was terrified. Obviously, it's okay to coerce people into belief so that later on their mind will accept it so later on they'll be able to accept it but if you have to coerce them first then you have to and you know, like we said if you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet yeah then you do it so this was justified by one of the leading theologians of the church saint augustine yes. right but remember they had declared this doctrine you know because they they established the canon of the scripture, right? About and what the time doctrine of that? that. Well, this would be in three twenty-five. Oh, yes, okay. In the Council right. of Nicaea, Nicaea. where mm -hmm. Council pulled them all together to coalesce to codify mm -hmm. a common doctrine for all Christians, and then so now they had a common doctrine. So that was the orthodox belief because it had not been defined before, right? That was orthodox belief, and every all the, any other belief was heterodox, heretical. Mm -hmm. Other belief, mm -hmm. right? So this is good, and this is bad. They defined it, right? Yes. Here's the catch: they didn't invite any of the Jewish Christian bishops to the Council of Nicaea. Oh, the fix was already in. Amen. So mostly Western representatives. Only, only, only the Gentile, yes. only the Gentile bishops. They were rejecting the this Judaic Church. You know, not only the Judaic Church of the, of the Orthodox synagogue Jews, but the Judaic Church of the Messianic, Messianic congregation that were believers in the Son of God, very firm believers in the Son of God. So, and uh, that was the original apostasy because they came up with theological justification for killing in the name of God, yes. killing fellow believers in the name of God. We're not talking about going to war here, right? We're talking about killing fellow congregants, the person sitting beside you in the aisle, you know, in the pews, that yes. person, 
you know, ridding the church of all those who wouldn't hew to the doctrine of the Roman church. Right. Yeah, so the, this, this is what they did, and they justified it theologically. That was the original apostasy, rejecting the church of Yeshua himself wow. and his apostles, declaring them heretic, and then hunting them down and burning their scriptures. Wow. And the original apostasy had been repeated throughout the centuries. It's all just a continuation of the original apostasy. The, the Spanish Inquisition, you had a massive resurgence of the Messianic Church in the Middle Ages. You had about a, a half a million Jews living in Spain. And about half of them, that's like a quarter of a million Jews, had converted to Christianity. Now, some were forced, but more you know, converted of their own free will. And a certain number of them uh, said, well, if we're going to do this, this is a Hebrew thing. We're going to do it in the Holy Tongue. We're going to do it in Hebrew. I mean, it's about it. It's a Hebrew story, isn't it? Yes, Hebrew absolutely. God, his son, a Hebrew boy made good, <laughs> taking a Hebrew message to the Hebrew That's right. people. That's right. And we're going to do it in the Holy Tongue. That's the only sacred tongue for Scripture, mm -hmm. especially in this case, right? So they had the Hebrew Gospels there. They had still survived over the centuries because, remember, the Roman Church had tried to destroy those. And it's been reported in church history that the Messianic Church Accord disappeared in the fifth century. They just went underground. They went underground. They did not disappear. But they sure hid. They sure got out of town. So a lot of them were pushed up into the north where they established a sea uh, that had nothing to do with Rome, never was under Rome. It's called the uh, Italic Sea. In fact, they used the Italic, Italic Bible. Yes. We're getting back, aren't we? Getting back to the, they used the Bible that had never been part of the Roman Catholic Church. They were never a part of the Roman Catholic Church. Totally different thing. Wow. Right? So what happened in, we're in the first part of the fourth century, Hire Eusebius of Caesarea, who wrote the biography of, of Constantine. He also wrote the book In Praise of Constantine. He also was given the contract to do a compilation mm -hmm. of all the Bibles in Greek. Greek. <laughs> Lucian had just done one only like 30 years ago, and it was universally adored by all the churches all across Christendom, mm -hmm. right? All the way to Constantinople, all the way to the east. It was called the Received Text, text. of the Bible. The Received Text. And it was developed outside of Rome before Rome even really got on their feet, right? Mm -hmm. And so Rome had to do a copy of the Bible that supported their doctrine, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, so they had somebody to play. And then they tried to destroy all the other copies of the ban and destroy all the other copies and the people along with them. And then about 60 years later, <clears throat> Jerome was commissioned to do a compilation of the, of the Bible in Latin. Latin. But remember, we already had compilations of the Bible in Latin in 150, the Itala. Right. And in 290, we had Lucian, who was a, uh, Lucian was an incredible person. He was a Hebrew speaker, probably Jewish Christian. See, he was just a marvelous scholar. Mm -hmm. And he fought against pagan influences being put into scripture. All right. Interesting. Yes. It because is that's exactly possible. what happened in, in the uh, scriptures that they wrote. I mean, do we celebrate the feast of Yehovah anymore? The feast of the of God? No. No. We no. celebrate pagan we, feasts. We, they, yeah, they factor in those things. Yeah, we, we celebrate Easter, which is and and the, the church was not even coy about this. They were very open, open about it, yes. They said, we are going to celebrate mm -hmm. the resurrection on the feast day of Easter. <laughs> they they <laughs> weren't red eyed at all. Well, they, see, there's a thing. The, the, these were very common pagan festivals. So now that people come in, now they're nominally rubber stamped them as Christians. So it makes it easier for you to, because they're just coming in for their regular feast day, but now they're Christians, not now they're sort of turning them into Christian feast days, right? Yes. Same thing with Christmas. It was Saturnalia. Two weeks of feasting to celebrate Saturn. Yeah. The winter now, the over the winter solstice time, ending with the feast day of the sun. Sunday, that was the sun's day. day. The sun. yes. And that was his annual, that was the unconquered sun. They used, and they did this on purpose to differentiate themselves from the Judaic church. That was more important to them. And following the truth of scripture. 
I, that's a hard thing, I think, for people to understand or it to is. accept, but it is true. true. They were more interested in creating a new church and differentiating it from the Judaic church and rejecting the Judaic church, including the Messianic church, right? So if you cover your head in church, well, we'll take our hat off. Yeah. <laughs> right? If you do, if you worship on Saturday, well, we're going to worship on Sunday. Yeah. 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 And there's no scriptural basis for that, sorry. You know, they try to create one, but anyone who can count to three can figure that out. Can the Good it. Friday to Easter Sunday is not three, three days. days. Not three days. You know, it's it's actually one day and yeah. two nights. Yeah. It's not three, three days by a long shot, right? But they, they created these doctrines, the doctrine of the Good Friday to Easter Sunday thing. And with these pillars, and the three and a half year ministry was another one that they created. You know, nobody thought it was a three and a half year ministry until Eusebius said it was. That's right. Yes, that's right. And to do that, he probably inserted John 6, 4. You know, yes. Uh, Passover, a feast day of the Jews was nine. Well, it's not, when we're born, it's not a feast day of the Jews, it's feast day of Yehovah. Mm -hmm. And when you say that, you are announcing that it's an, it is an insertion. Yes. So they alarm bell should go off in your head. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say that to Jews. That's right. Right? Yes. Why would you say that? You yeah. wouldn't. You say that to Greeks. Yeah. Exactly. I'm speaking about them in the third person. Yes. I'm not one. Right? Yes, absolutely. So, so I guess moving ahead now, I guess the Messianics uh, with the Hebrew manuscripts, and they go into hiding and they take their manuscripts with them. And they disappear, more or less. I mean, where are they? I mean, how did you come across them? And how did you come across the knowledge of them? And that's a really good question. Because I thought, how do you possibly trace an underground <laughs> church? How do you? They're underground. They're mm -hmm. hiding out for a reason. How do you possibly trace them? Yeah. And it came to me. You look where the church is attacking. Yes. The Roman church is attacking to try and wipe out these heretics. You know? And you look at them and you look at them honestly and say, okay, are these really degenerate people or are are are, are they? Mm -hmm. You know, and you find out that a lot of these I'm not gonna speak up for every heretic, but uh, that these neo messianic movements, these people were holding to the true gospel. They were preserving it carefully, keeping it preserved, the received yes. text of the Bible, outside wow. of the grip of the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were in the north, the Waldensians. The Waldensians. Yeah, well. the Waldensians, the people of the valleys, because uh, they were in the plain, the Piedmont plain up there in northern mm -hmm. Italy, but Rome, as their strength grew, around 1000 AD, began to put out military might and basically slaughter them and drive them, trying to wipe them out and burn all their books, right? That's always a part of it, but we, we forget that because the the horror of slaughtering the people, you forget that they also were burning all their books, burning all their scripture. And so they just kept driving them further and further up into the valleys of the Alps. So these just kept going further and further. They never did wipe out the Waldensians. And that's the impression I had, that then they, they never were wiped out. No, they, they weren't. There were other neo-Messianic movements that were. The conversos of Spain were pretty much, they were thousands and thousands were burned at the stake, and they threw many in prison. A lot of them died because in prison because they didn't feed them well, you know, and they got sick and they died. They seized all their property. They, they did a number on them. They really treated them terribly. Some escaped to other parts of Europe, of course, a lot of them escaped to the part of Europe and to the New World, which is important. And the Cathars of southern France were a neo messianic group. Now, they were Gnostic, right? But, you know, there are some unmistakable Gnostic elements about the, yes. the Gospels. So I'm not, I'm not, their, I'm not their, the judge. It's very clear the Cathars were, were very beautiful religious people who believed so deeply you know, and what they're doing in that. See, the Roman church at this point had become so corrupt. The priests were so corrupt. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they were keeping prostitutes. Of course, they paid the bishop for that, for that privilege, right? 
Remember, they were selling indulgences. Indulgences, yes. So they were allowed to keep prostitutes yes. if, wow. they, if they paid the bishop. Wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> indulgences. Right, and they would come to the house to do anything and, and take the silverware and, and just steal things. I mean, really, and they were they were just corrupt. They couldn't read. They were illiterate. Yeah. You know, they were idle. They were lazy. They were lustful. I mean, what do you expect, though? Yeah. A church has fallen into apostasy. What do you expect? Of course. You know, they had declared the, the church of Yeshua heretics, heretics. Yes. And, and, and attacked them and hunted them to extinction or tried to. Right? What do you expect is going to happen to those people? That they're going to suddenly become paragons of virtue? That didn't happen. All the while uh, <clears throat> developing for themselves a life of power. They're just, power. They're just amassing yeah. power is what they're doing. Yeah. And they were doing it militarily and through oh clever gosh. and you know diplomatic means through lies and deception yes. and deviousness. You know, and they were wiping out anybody who disagreed with them. That's what you see in the Spanish Inquisition, right? And they're doing that to their fellow congregants. These are people that have converted to Christianity. They actually didn't have any authority over anybody who hadn't converted to Christianity. They only had authority over those people. They didn't have authority over Jews. Now, Jews were oppressed, but not by the Inquisition. Because yeah. they couldn't touch them. They, didn't, they couldn't touch Muslims. Only Christians. Wow. But over Christians, they had life and death authority. And they used it. So if you had any Judaic roots, uh, the, the sin or the, the heresy was one of Judaizing. So what does that mean? To do things like the Jews do. So what would that be? Let's, let's name a few of them. Using the name of God would be Judaizing, right? Yes. Uh, Yehovah, mm -hmm. that'd be Judaizing. Using the name of his son, Yeshua HaMashiach, that would be Judaizing. Mm -hmm. Possessing a Hebrew gospel, gospel, that would be Judaizing. Big one. Observing the Sabbath that day, that mm -hmm. would be Judaizing, right? Mm -hmm. Reciting any kind of Hebrew prayer, that would be Judaizing. Generally speaking, Hebrew. Generally being Hebrew was enough to get you burned at the stake. These were the charges they were. Oh yeah, against. and and you know the the Messiah would have been guilty of all. He would have been guilty. Of, that's true. And his that's apostles true. would have yeah. been guilty of. Yeah. And they would even brag. Heck, we could we could convict Peter with the mm. methods we used. But they didn't even bother trying to get evidence. They they got achieved confessions through torture. Wow. Or the threat of torture. It was so terrible. I know it is terrible, but what do you expect? A church has committed I, such an apostasy. Remember, these people, this is the original apostasy, the rejection of the Messianic Apostolic Church of the Messiah himself. And they had not degenerated. They were not degenerate. They were very, very uh, powerful Christians. And very, they, in fact, they moved up to Antioch and cre created a, a civilization for centuries that was of surpassing beauty. They had the they had the most cultivated people. They had the finest schools in the world. The finest schools in the world, Syria did. They were the center of Christianity for 700 years after Yeshua. Rome and Alexandria teamed up in an alliance against Antioch. Hmm. Okay, so these were obviously the apostate churches there. Yeah. <laughs> Rome yeah. and Alexandria against the Jewish Christian church, which it was in Syria, all your Hebrews, your Messianics had moved up there. And that was the center of evangelism in the early centuries, very obviously so. And that's where Lucian was in Antioch, mm -hmm. creating that. And very possibly the Atala was also written there. But they had it. So, you know, you're, you've got a competition going on here. And this may be hard for people to accept, but... They were not about salvation anymore. They were about amassing power and destroying anyone who stood in their way. Yeah. That's what it was about. And about. they did that throughout the centuries. And it was all a continuation of the original apostasy. It's okay for us to destroy people. It's justified by God. For us to destroy people that don't hold to our doctrine. Because our doctrine, of course, is supreme. It's divine. Right? We are right. Everyone else yeah. is wrong. Yes. Absolutely. And you bring up such a, a very, very important point about the apostasy. 
And, and the church has been brilliant of saying, the great apost the apostasy is going to be in the future. Don't look over here. There's no apostasy going on over here. It's down the road somewhere. So mm. I, I find that very fascinating. No, no, I never heard that perspective. Well, that's how my brain works. It's kind of weird. <laughs> but but uh, so where where in the world then are these these copies of these Hebrew manuscripts? Uh, where are they pocketed in the world? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Well. Well, Lindsian manuscripts, they're the ones who yeah. survived them. Well, I got my first ones. Uh, I'd been studying this, the Hebrew Gospels, for a year mm -hmm. when I got a divine tap on the shoulder <laughs> that said, go to Israel, find the earliest manuscript of the Gospels in Hebrew. And so I went, and I did find the earliest. Wow. And I went to work with that. I went to the staff of the National Library in Israel worked with them. They were wonderful, wonderfully supportive. And they actually have a database that's called the Polanski Project. So apparently the Polanskis put up a lot of money for them to go to every library, every museum in the world, and digitize every single Hebrew manuscript. Manuscript means handwritten. So these are all old, you know, generally pre-1600, because the, the printing press came in in 1452, but it wasn't widely disseminated for another century or so. Mm -hmm. But by 1600, it was everywhere, right? So before 1600, you were still having it. So we're talking about handwritten manuscripts, the ancient ones, right? They copied them all. So I'm, uh, I'm in, in Israel, and I tell them what I'm looking for. There is manuscript, the Hebrew Gospel. <laughs> this is how easy it is. You know, when, when God tells you to do something, he, he, he just gets it <laughs> like on a silver platter. At least that's been my experience. It's not because I guess he wants to make it clear it's not through any virtue of mine. Right, right. He said he'd give it to me, and yes. here it is. There it is. So I go there, and they said, Here's the earliest one. This is a 15th century manuscript yes. of the Hebrew Gospels from Spain, uh, from Catalonia, actually, yes. which still exists. Catalonia does. So I got it, but the, the prefaces were by Jerome. Now, Jerome was fourth century, century, yeah, and he was the guy who translated the Hebrew gospel, our gospels, into Latin and Greek. And he's, he says this multiple times in his writings, you know, and he considers it the authentic gospel. The authentic, Matthew is the authentic gospel, mm -hmm. right? So he has great respect for it. He's a great lover of books. He hated people, but he loved books. <laughs> He did. He did. Much of his writing was excoriating others, all of his, all of his opponents, just to raking them over the coals. But he did love books, and he had translated these himself. I'm thinking, well, these prefaces are by Jerome, and he's fourth century. This can't be a fifteenth century manuscript. It must go back earlier. Must go back earlier, yeah. Because he either wrote those prefaces when he was translating it, or the prefaces were already in the Gospels, and he just translated them too, mm -hmm. which is likely to be the case, I think, because these prefaces are very important themselves. The preface to Matthew says it was already written in yes. the, the Lashon Kodesh, the Holy Tongue. Mm -hmm. It had already been written. It's, it says that in the preface to Matthew that it was originally written in Hebrew. You're not going to find that in any Greek or Latin preface, I guarantee you. <laughs> but you do find it in the Waldensian Gospels. Yes. It says that in the preface. That's and it also says it in the preface to Luke that it had already been written for those in Judea, which obviously would have been in Hebrew. It does say that in the in the prefaces to the Waldensian Gospels, for example. Mm -hmm. The same thing. And the Remont Book of John is another Waldensian manuscript. Wow. So Remont Catalan, uh, we have Gospels that are apparently part of the Hebrew manuscript tradition. In fact, that there's even Hebrew Gospels, the mind blowing enough, but now we're discovering that there is actually a Hebrew manuscript tradition. Wow. And we know what the markers are. Because I've translated the Hebrew Gospels, so I know what the markers are. And I look when you at say that. markers, what do you mean? I, well, markers, markers are things that are different yeah. from the Hebrew Gospels than from the Greek Gospels. Right, and here's, here's one that's really significant. John 1.1. 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was God. Mm -hmm. Is that what it says in the Greek? No. What does it say? 
In the beginning was the Word, and the right. Word was. Well, that's quite a difference. And it's also really significant because, you know, it's a clear statement of belief in the Son of God, right? Uh, By these Hebrew people, they clearly believed in the Son of God, that he was divine. They were very definitely believers. And you had mentioned something, or also <laughs> another interesting one was about um, where, where Yeshua said, don't put your light under a bushel. Mm. And you, you brought up a very interesting that's a different sort of difference, but that's, it, a different, it that's, not, a, that's not a marker, though. It, well, it, it may be, but uh, it, but the, see, these other books were written in Rumon or Catalan, yeah. But they they had definitely been translated from the Hebrew, mm -hmm. so you can tell. But the thing is, there are a lot of words that are translated out of the Bible because they don't really want to emphasize them. So, what are those words? The name of God, mm -hmm. the name of His Son, the Torah. That's translated into law, which is much more ambiguous yes. uh, thing that's hard to really... When it says Torah, you know it's talking about the royal law of God himself, not Egyptian law or Greek law or what we would or consider Mishnah. Roman law or what we would yeah. consider our rabbinic law, yeah. right? None of those things is God's yeah. law, right? So that menorah is also translated out of the Bible. And wow. uh, the Aleph Tav is translated out of the Bible. So there's a number of things, and they're yeah. very, they can be highly, highly significant, especially in the name of God, but the feast days are translated out of the Bible. Yeah. Right? So, it, you know, in the, in the Hebrew Gospels, it talks about, in John, it talks about Yeshua going up to the Feast of Hanukkah. The only place in any Hebrew scripture but the Feast of Hanukkah as a continuing event is mentioned. Amazing. It's not mentioned in any Jewish scripture except for the New Testament. They observe it. The only places mentioned in scripture is in the Hebrew Gospels. But of course you won't see it in your Bible. But say you went, went up to the Feast of Dedication. Dedication. Right? So they translate down the Bible. Translate. So they translate this Passover is Passover in some places. But in, in uh, Acts, for example, a couple of places, they, they have backwritten the word Easter into it in order to give validity to Easter as a holiday. But in the Greek, it was Pascha, which is Pasqua, which is Passover, which is Pesach in Hebrew. So the Greek word is from the Hebrew word. So they were talking about Passover, but they translated it as Easter. And that's an abomination to have. Yes. I mean, we're talking Easter is the Babylonian. Fertility goddess, sex yes. goddess, really, you know. So that's pretty. That's pretty abominable change to make. You don't change scripture yeah. because you want it to be well, something more pleasing to you. <laughs> you know? Right. You said so don't, don't add to or take away. Right. Don't. Right. And the, the, oh, here's one interesting one. You remember where they come to Yeshua and they they want to gig him for doing something wrong, so the Pharisees accuse him. Your apostles don't even wash their hands before they <laughs> right. did in, in the end time he said. And you, you know, there there really isn't any. There is not. It, there, there isn't any prohibition against that. There right. is not. It yeah. is a rabbinical thing. And I think we can all accept that it's a pretty good idea. But it's, it's not it's sinful. And, it's, it's, <laughs> and, and so Rishua says to them, yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any idea what you do? You're, you're, you're Pharisees. You declare yourself korban, so you don't even have to take care of your mother and father. Why don't they translate the word korban? It's not a hard translation. There's no reason why you shouldn't. They don't want you to know what it means. Mm -hmm. It is, is the practice of leaving your estate, all your possessions, to the church, church. before you die. Right. Okay, so therefore... You don't have any money. You don't. You don't have to support your parents because you it's not your money. To the you dedicated it to the church, yeah. so you declare yourself korban. Well, how much of the revenue of the church do you think comes from people leaving their estates to the church? Probably a, a little lot. Decent amount. Yeah. A real decent yeah. amount. Yeah. So they don't want a scripture that questions that that's not a wise thing to do sometimes. Yeah. Or in a certain way, they they don't want a scripture in the Bible that's critical of that practice. Yeah. So they just don't translate it. Yeah. And so you all read it. I've read it, and 
Okay, what's Corban? And then you go on, you know. So you don't really, you don't understand what they're talking about. Yes. But it's a real simple concept. It's leaving your estate to the church before you die, so you don't have any money. Right. So you use that as a way of getting out of honoring your father and your mother and taking care of them as you should. You know, you're in, in ancient days, your children were your Obamacare. Yes, that's right. They were right. your insurance yeah. for the future. If you didn't have children, that's why there's a Levitical law that if a, a brother died, you know, leaving his widow, it was the responsibility of the existing brothers, the rest of the family. She was part of the family. It was their responsibility to provide her with a, a child that was her child mm -hmm. and the dead brother's child, not the other brother's child who right. actually planted the seed. Right, right. It was that child and that was dedicated to that mother. That was so she would be taken care of in her old age. Yes. It wasn't a macho thing because trust me, these brothers didn't want this to have to take care of this older woman and another mouth to feed plus her child. They didn't, they were not crazy about having that sort of thing, you know, so they were doing it out of a sense of duty. And you, you that's why you have this thing with Judah and Tamar. Yes. Because those, yes. the, the other sons were actually so corrupt that Yehovah killed, killed them. them. Yes, they did. So they would not be part of the line of descent. And then Tamar tricked Judah into to getting her with child. And he ended up saying, well, she's more righteous than I, because he had that obligation to do that. Yeah, he that was his obligation: give her a child, yeah. you know, to take care of her in her old age. That was absolutely essential. If you didn't have any children, you were you were dead. Yeah, it just shows you how Father really he really cares for the well-being of his people. He does as a provision. I wanted to talk about the Hebrew Gospels where we found them. So I had gone to to Israel mm -hmm. and I got a hold of the, the Hebrew Gospels from Catalonia from the Vatican Library. It had been bound beneath another manuscript wow. for almost 500 years. Yeah. Okay. And so it was not discovered until 1956. Never been translated. Okay. So Never I, been translated. I translated it. I did the initial translation. Then I figured there's got to be more out there. That's when I went to Europe. To, to check out the major libraries and discovered the five additional Hebrew manuscripts of the Gospels yeah. from Cochin in India, from the St. Thomas Christians, the congregation of Thomas the Apostle, wow. who went to India. Went to India, yeah. Yes, and we have historical uh, attestation that the Hebrew Gospel went there with them. Wow. And Barnabas carried a Hebrew Gospel there. The, Bar the Barnabas and the Bible. Yes, that went with Paul. He carried the Hebrew Gospel there. Wow. Okay, so Thomas probably already already had one, but Barnabas carried one there. And in the next century, Pantaneus went from Alexandria to India and brought back a copy of the Hebrew Gospel of Alexandria. So Arihan had it in the next generation. Mm -hmm. When he did his very famous hexaplot, where he, he compared six versions of the Bible in Hebrew and in Greek. Wow. You know, that has disappeared. They didn't like a region. When they didn't like you, your work seems to have disappeared. <laughs> all your hard work. So didn't, they didn't like a region. They didn't like Lucian. So all their writings disappear. Mm -hmm. Right? So uh, these, uh, uh, we obtain these new Gospels. And there are also some in the British Library, mm -hmm. uh, which we also have. Uh, one of those is the Hazan Manuscript, which is wow. the first seven pages of Revelation in Hebrew. And when we found the Cochin Gospels, the Cochin is was, you know, I remember opening this book up. This, in, this one I found in the Ryan's Library in Manchester. I had had some people working ahead and they talked to the curator and said, yeah, we do have a Hebrew Gospel manuscript, Hebrew manuscript. <laughs> so it was, it was like a 19th century one. Yeah. <laughs> what could that be, a 19th century one? I mean, the printing press was invented in 1452. Yes. Who's writing a, a handwritten, <laughs> it was a labor of love or something? But I opened it up. It was a beautiful manuscript. And it said, in Hebrew, the good notes of Matthew. The good news of Mark, the good news of Luke, the good news of John. Wow. Wow. The Hebrew Gospels in, in Hebrew. Beautifully done. Beautifully done. It was recopied in 1810 from the older manuscripts that they had in the old Jerusalem characters, they were called. This is a translator's note. 
I got them. I got this document, and as I as I read through it and studying it, I discovered it didn't end at John. It had Acts. It had, oh. in fact, it had all the epistles in the New Testament. It was a complete Brit Hadashah, hmm. a New Testament in Hebrew, complete first one ever. Wow. Yeah, the first one ever that's been discovered. That I had a second manuscript called the Cochin New Testament. It was also complete except for Revelation. But one of the other manuscripts was Revelation. Revelation. It, it was a different manuscript, different hand and all, but they these two were usually bound together, so you'd have another complete volume of it. So we have two versions, two complete manuscripts wow. of Revelation, two complete manuscripts of every every book, every epistle in the New That's Testament, amazing. in Hebrew. And um, they, we have managed to validate them as coming from a first century source. Wow. And, we, and this is really interesting because I didn't, I didn't think we had a prayer of being able to do this. I'm a historical linguist. How would you do that? I, have, I couldn't imagine. I would well, to think I about know. it. What would be ideal? What would be ideal is you have a, a reliable, a credible ancient source that says there's something different about the Hebrew Gospels than the Greek Gospels. Maybe it's a quotation, an yeah. event that happened, something of that nature, but it's different in the Hebrew Gospels, different in the Greek Gospels. It'd be better if you had several ancient sources right, right, saying right. the same thing. Okay. It's even better if you had independent historical evidence of that. Yes. Differing Quotation or event. Point. I see your point. Right. That would be nice. Yeah. And the that earlier nice. you got them, the better. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, that has to be shown to be the case in the Hebrew Gospels we hold in our hands today. Wow. Right. Okay. So when I read when I read the research, a lot of what I do is 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 filling in the context of history and doing the historical research and reading, you know, all about how these came about and who did it. So Jerome is very important. And he wrote that in the Hebrew gospel, they write not about the tearing of the veil at the crucifixion of Yeshua, the Messiah, not about the tearing of the veil, but they write about the lintel stone, the huge stone over the entryway of the Holy of Holies, this which is split in half yes. during the earthquake and fell to the mm -hmm. ground. Okay, so that's what they talk about. Now keep in mind what's hanging beneath the lintel stone is the veil, yeah, yes. right? But they don't mention the veil because to the Hebrews, to the Messianic Christians who preserved this mm -hmm. in the Hebrew Gospels, the foreshadowing of the destruction of the temple, which happened only 40 years later, which had been prophesied by Yeshua himself and by Daniel, that was the big deal to them. I mean, it's the temple. The, the uh, Israelites had become a nation of temple worshipers because Herod the Great had built this incredible temple, and it was incredible. But it was also demonized. Yes, you know, and and they they were corrupt, corrupt to the core. The people that built it, and it gave legitimacy to him as a spiritual leader that he didn't deserve. He's one of the most cruelest, darkest, most corrupt kings to ever sit the throne. And he was the one who. Herod Antipas, who was the son of Herod yes. the Great, he was the one who engineered the plot to kill Yeshua sure. and wash yeah. his hands of it, so he didn't have to take yes. didn't have to take yes. any responsibility <laughs> for it. That's but, right. And so he comes on and says, yes. "Oh no, we don't find any problem with him. This is a lamb without yes. blemish. We, there's nothing wrong with him." And, and Pilate said the same. Yes. So they found him to be a lamb without blemish. Well, here's the proof of that. Herod Antipas had a huge secret police force. He could mobilize a riot anytime he wanted or a riotous crowd to yes. demand anything he wanted. If he didn't want Yeshua to be crucified, no one would have spoke up against him. And yet you have this crowd mm. of his secret police. Excellent. So this was, a, this was a particular characteristic of the Herods is they had a secret police they could marshal. Mm. They could marshal a riot anytime they wanted. <laughs> you know? Wow. Yeah, oh yeah, they were they were big, big on that. So he would not have if he hadn't agreed to that, nobody would have spoken up and demanded Yeshua's blood on their head. 
You know, it was right. Herod. It was Herod was behind all of that. But he wanted to not take responsibility for it. He didn't want to be seen as taking away the people's Messiah. Right. Right. But he did the plot. I mean, he was a dark and evil guy. But he had also built this magnificent temple, so it made him look good. Right. Well, guess what Yehovah did to in testimony of his son. Right. Mm -hmm. An earthquake that split it. It desecrated the Holy of Holies, could never be fixed. Never fixed. But nobody is allowed into the inner temple. So, the, the, I mean, the temple is a cash cow to the Herodian priests. They were making money. <laughs> That's right. You, bring a, you, you had to bring an animal for sacrifices. So you bring a goat and, well, they would inform you, well, sorry, but your goat has a blemish. Mm. However, for a fee, for a, a small fee, I will provide you with a goat without blemish, and I'll take this one as a down payment. So you would get the goat and the price of the goat. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> and you also couldn't give tithe, your tithe money, to to the temple if it had uh, any kind of pagan, like it had the emperor's sites on it, mm -hmm. had any kind of pagan image on it. Right. So that's what the money changers were. Ah, yes. So they would exchange it for money that did not have pagan imagery on it to, for a small fee, of course. Mm. Yeah. So they were cleaning up. Mm. They were they were cheating the believers left and right. They were making tons of money. Wow. But it was a beautiful temple, but it was demonized, right? Mm -hmm. And when the, the apostles showed Yeshua the, this magnificent temple, he wasn't impressed at all. He said, don't you see all this? Not yes. one stone is going to be left standing <laughs> on it. He did. He, he said did. that, and it happened. Yes. You know, it happened Forty like years that. later, it happened to wow. the day. They had the daybreak trial where they condemned him to death for blasphemy. It happened in the Sanhedrin chamber, the St. John. It happened in that Sanhedrin chamber, the chamber of Yun Stone, which was also damage during the same earthquake. It's only 40 yards away from the Holy of Holies, right? Mm -hmm. They could hide the Holy of Holies, but the Sanhedrin Chamber of Yun Stone, it was called, very majestic chamber, was so structurally damaged it was unsafe, they had to move out of it. So that was Yehovah's testimony mm -hmm. to his son. That was the last judgment they made in that chamber. Wow, was, that is fascinating. I've not heard that part before. No. I remember you talking about the lentil, yeah. but I didn't catch the other thing about the same. Well, here's the thing. The, that is mentioned in three places in Scripture, in the Gospels. It's mentioned in Matthew and Mark and Luke. Matthew 2751, and then it's mentioned in Mark and Luke also, okay? Yeah. And they also speak about the tearing of the veil, which was very important to the Greek church. It symbolized that they didn't have to go through any Hebrew priest. Right. The Hebrew authority was gone. They could commune directly with Yehovah, right, without any intervention of the, of the Hebrew authority. They could totally get out from the Hebrew authority. So it's very important to them. But to the Messianic community and to the Jewish community, and this was their temple, this, the, the foreshadowing of its destruction that was prophesied by Yeshua and by Nick, that was the most important thing to them. Mm -hmm. And the breaking of the lintel was a foreshadowing of the complete destruction of the temple, which happened 40 years later. So it's just a different perspective, because it seems apparent that the lintel was broken, and it tore the veil into that was hanging underneath mm. it, but they didn't mention the veil. That was important to them. You know, but to the, to the Greeks, that was all important. So it's just two different perspectives of the same event. They're not con of the same event. They're not contradictory. But one was mentioned in the Greek gospel. One was mentioned in the Hebrew gospel. Okay, so that's number one, right? You have credible ancient sources that said this, Jerome, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. said this. And you have uh, multiple other sources. Joseph has said the same thing. The author, uh, Passionis Domini, I don't, wow. it was anonymous, but he wrote it the same thing, that the, the early church tradition was that it was the lintel that had split. Oh. So it's mentioned in other places. There are multiple citations from ancient sources, mm -hmm. right? And this is from the early church tradition, the first century yes. church tradition. And that's how it's written up in the Hebrew Bible. So then we look in our Hebrew Gospels and I read that, you know, God took me by the hand and said, okay, 
<laughs> now go check these three verses. <laughs> yes. And I go check them. They all talk about the stones of the temple being split. Wow. Right. right? <laughs> from, from the top to the bottom, from the front to the back. Wow. The whole temple, the inner temple was was split in two. And that would have split the lintel stone. Okay, so this is this is pretty significant stuff, right? It is. Right. So that just is exactly what Jerome was saying, exactly what the earliest church tradition was that was written in the Hebrew Gospels. Okay, so let's let's fast forward to the Cochin Gospels that I discovered in India. Okay, well, I go read those, and you gotta you gotta remember that these two gospels, although they both have historical attestation, being very early gospels that were from a first century source, both of them did, but they're separated by two thousand years. And 5,000 miles. Mm. So I go ahead and I look at these three verses Matthew 27 51, Mark and Luke, right, about the splitting of the veil. Mm. And they all say exactly the same thing. There was the lintel but stone, but they're even more specific. The lintel stone itself, the actual stones of the temple that were cracked into. Wow. You know, how could that be? You know, that's not collusion. That's not. <laughs> it's not collusion. That's from the early church tradition, from the first century church tradition. So that's one of the things. It's just one. There are, there are a lot of other things about it, but I think that's the most important proof. But to end, I will give you my favorite one. Yeshua comes back from the dead. He's resurrected. Yes. He meets the Marys on the road. Yes. In the in the King James Bible and a lot of other Bibles, it says, he says, All hail. Well, that's not the way believers spoke to each other. They used the name of God. Right? <laughs> okay, this was the Roman military story. And this is how you did it. You slammed your fist against your breastplate <laughs> and you thrust them in the air. All hail. Boom. All hail. It's a Roman military salute. That's right. Now you got to remember that Adolf Hitler is a big fan of Mussolini. Yes. Right. And he adopted the Roman military salute as the Nazi oh, salute. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> All right. So because of, you know, people ask me, what difference does it make whether it's written Hebrew and Greek? Well, because we have the Hebrew, I can assure all of your listeners that Yeshua did not greet his followers with the Nazi salute. <laughs> Because we have it in the Hebrew Gospels, they said to them, God is our salvation. And in Hebrew, that's Yehovah Yoshiahenu. And Yoshia is the same word as Yeshua. Because Yeshua means salvation. Yes. And so uh, uh, another part of the story is that uh, during Sukkot, they, the, the very climax of Sukkot, which is one of the three holidays, you got Passover. And Shavuot in the fall, Passover, and what we call uh, Pentecost in the in the spring, and then the fall you have Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. But uh, these three people would come from all over the world. Literally, the Jews would come from all over the world for this. And so at Sukkot, it's an eight-day festival, and uh, the climax of it, you know, they get up in all their gear, their effort mm -hmm. to be on that swinging incense and pipes mm -hmm. yes, and drums yes, and, yes. you know, in parade all the way down to, they would go down to the pool of Gihon and uh, they would pull water from what is called in Isaiah, the Mayane Ha Yeshua. Oh, yes. The springs of salvation. salvation. And it had to be... It had to be flowing water. That's what it meant. Yes. Living water. Living was flowing water. water yes. If you let it sit, it becomes stagnant. It's dead. Right? Okay. And it's toxin. It's toxic. So it had to be flowing water. It had to be living water. And you take it from the Mayane Yeshua, And this is the water of salvation. Yes. The water of Yeshua. Right. And then in procession, they take it back up to the temple. And at the temple, they pour red wine into it, which symbolizes blood. So now it becomes the blood of Yeshua. The blood of salvation, right? The blood of Yeshua, literally. In Hebrew. Yes. And they pour it out on the altar. Well, everyone, every Hebrew assembled from all over the world, shouts out in one voice. Yehovah is our Yeshua. Yeshua. Yehovah Yoshiahenu. 
Uh, Yehovah is our Yeshua. Yeshua. Yes. Well, Satan had to end that practice, didn't he? Yes. Because some people are going to wake up. Yehovah is our Yeshua. Yes. What I mean, Yeshua, the Messiah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the one. So he had to kill that one. He had to take it out. But that was, uh, that's just, and, and we come back to that question of what, why is it important? What, what does it matter? It is written in Hebrew or Greek. And the answer to that is it doesn't matter at all unless you care about the truth of Scripture. Oh. And if you care about the truth of Scripture, mm -hmm. it makes a huge difference because everything we know about our Hebrew Messiah, we know through a Greek filter of a different language, culture, and thought. Everything we know about Hebrew Messiah. And I don't know about you, but that's not acceptable it's to me. It's not acceptable to me. I know. Well, I want to thank you for Well, I want to thank you because this has been, I mean, I could go on for hours and I've been, I've been very blessed to have you here and we've talked quite a bit also offline. So thank you so much. Well, let me, let me say that anyone who's interested can uh, look up further information on writingofgod.com. Writingofgod.com. Yes. Please sign up for our newsletter and we'll send you research updates. We'll send you research updates on the latest and the research we're doing because I am. I put together a team of translators, about 12 translators, and we're, we're working as fast as we can to translate all of the Hebrew Gospels into an English Hebrew version. So that's going to be out there. In fact, what we've done is I've written a free ebook. And you can get it just by going yes. to writingofgod.com yes. and go to free download mm -hmm. and you enter your email and you'll get a free download of, uh, it's an ebook. it's called The Hebrew Gospels, Do They Exist? Yes. And it's it's an annotated bibliography of about, there's about 15 uh, Hebrew Gospel manuscripts out there. So this is answering the question, do they exist? Well, you can see them. Yes, you can. There'll be a page view of each one of them and a little paragraph describing its importance and some of the differences between it and the Greek Gospels. It's a great book. It's free. It will always be free. It will always be updated. So go to writingofgod.com and sign up for it and you get it for free. Okay, and you can pass it out to anyone you want, but have, better to have them go to the website so they'll be on our research updates, news list, uh, newsletter list as well. Right. Yes, and I'll have that in the show notes with the website address and uh, a lot of other little things uh, regarding his books and everything else for you and pointing you to his website. So I do want to thank you. You're more yeah, than welcome. I really appreciate it. And as always, fellow saints in training, may you be most blessed. Take care. Amen. Well, beloved, I trust that you were as blessed as I was by the discussion session I had with Dr. Jones. And I would encourage you, if you are so led, to check out the Good Doctors Ministry website, www.thewritingofgod.com. Again, thewritingofgod.com, as well as his YouTube channel that goes by the very same name, The Writing of God. I would encourage you to order his books if you're led and download his free PDF file, the one that he referred to during his discussion with me on the subject of the Hebrew Gospels and engage and support his ministry. That being all said and done, we'll return next week, Abba willing, with our concluding discussion on Paul and circumcision, a question of one's Jewishness. And until then... And as always, beloved, may you be most blessed, fellow saints in training.